As you will know, there is a new all singing, all dancing, maybe not all Toyota, Toyota Supra, and it is everywhere. So we want to do one very straightforward thing with it today, which is try against its primary rivals and find out which car is best. So for that, we have the 100% BMW M2 competition, which is our big brawny front engine rear wheel drive contender. We've got the light and delicate Alpine A110, the four wheeled souffle of the group. And at the back, we have the Porsche Cayman T, which is turbocharged, mid-engined four-cylinder, but it still sets the benchmark for handling. So we're just gonna spend a bit of time in each of them, have a discussion and see which one we think is the best. Now, if you like this sort of thing, we're here all the time with news, reviews, group tests, motor shows, drag races, and the like. So up thumb, subscribe, and if you turn on notifications, you'll never miss one. Okay, so we'll start in the Alpine A110. And what I like about this test is that there are four cars, but they all do something quite different. I mean, the end goal is the same. They're all sports coupes, which are supposed to show you a good time, but they all go about it in different ways, even though two are front engine, two are mid engine. Even then there are sort of nuanced differences. But what I particularly like about the A110 is that it is our agility benchmark. It's so light, this car. It weighs not much more than a thousand kilos. The engine's in the middle. It's only a 1.8 driving through a seven speed dual clutch transmission. Not the world's greatest, but not a bad one. And it just changes direction so amazingly willingly that it's just terrific. It just feels like it pivots right around its middle. That doesn't mean it's the most stable car in high speed corners, but it's just great fun and on the road it just just its alertness and its willingness to go from one direction to another while still having room to breathe there's a reasonable amount of roll and compliance it's the sort of sports car that people just don't make very much anymore is it perfect no by any means I mean there's not a lot of storage space inside this cabin as a daily proposition it's not the easiest of all these cars to live with. There's one cup holder and it's right back there. The infotainment system is just rubbish. So you have to make compromises, but that is the kind of way with a car like this. It's, it's one of those cars that cannot do everything because this bespoke aluminum architecture has been developed to be so small, so compact, relatively narrow, even though the transverse engine fits between the wishbones at the back and the same goes with the fuel tank at the front and the, the result is just this really delicious lightweight unique little thing now I'm aware it's a bit of a rare groove I kind of feel like in recommending it I kind of feel like a, a film critic recommending some two and three quarter hour dubbed German comedy or something you know it's a rare art house groove kind of car it's not for everybody, but what it does do, it does really wonderfully. It won't do everything that, say, an M2 competition will do, but they cannot do. None of the other cars here, I don't think, can really quite do what this one does as a result of its lack of inertia. And there's something really to cherish about that, because, look, if we don't appreciate cars like this, then mainstream manufacturers just won't make them and that will be a shame anyway so I really like it it's kind of our benchmark handling car but let's go and swap and get my friend and colleague James into the next one so this is the Porsche Cayman this is the car that outwardly inwardly, however you like to say it, whether they'll admit it or not, this is the car that all other manufacturers benchmark. You want to build a sports car, you've got to beat the Cayman. And why is that? Well, it is simply the best, certainly in terms of its chassis, mid-engined, just honed to perfection. And in this case, we're in the Cayman T, so this is the new one. This is arguably the most focused of the lot, the, the purest. It's meant to be a little bit lighter, although I'm not sure some fabric door straps really do much. Um, it's got the smallest engine, the two litre, but it's now delivering 296 horsepower and it revs out to 7,000 RPM. 
20 millimeter lower chassis, torque vectoring limited slip differential. It's the car that basically the purist wants to drive. Focused, sharp, responsive. And it really is. In terms of chassis, this thing is just sublime. The steering, it feels a little bit slow at first, but then it weights up nicely and it's just giving you enough feedback. And that, that slightly slow reaction allows you to build up the load through the chassis and start to feel both axles working. And you do, you feel them both working. It's just balanced. That's the only word I can think to describe it. It's beautifully, beautifully balanced. It's just a car you revel in. Every corner is just something to enjoy and savour. Yes, it's got a lot of grip, and with that mid-engine configuration, it's got lots and lots of traction, so, you know, throwing it around requires some commitment. You've really got to want to get the back out, and on the road, that's probably going to end in a, an interesting conversation with your insurance company. But on a track here, you can really start to manipulate it and feel how the balance works, and it's, it's just so nice. Now, obviously, there's an elephant in the room here, and you can probably hear it. It's that flat four engine. Now, we've been critical of this in the past. Porsche have done some work. It's got a new petrol particulate filter to meet WLTP regulations. They say it sounds better. I'm not sure it does. And the worst thing is probably what feels like a flat spot all the way up to 3,000 RPM. It just feels flaccid. And peak torque is meant to come in at 2,150 RPM. I don't know whether it's running late at the moment, but I can't feel it. And the noise at idle, it sounds like not that throbbing intent that a Subaru has. It's kind of a tapty tapty of an air-cooled Beetle. It's, it's not very sports car. It's effective enough, and once you get above 3,000 RPM, it piles on the revs, and you get going with a certain amount of alacrity. But up until that point, it's just a bit come on here we go and yeah it's just not it's not what you expect of a Porsche you want that howling flat six but we can't have it so we live with it and instead you just have to revel in that chassis which oh it's just sublime you can just play with it all day long I can see why every chassis engineer worth his salt basically takes one of these out comes back scratches his head a little bit and says how are we going to beat this <laughs> oh I do like this car I just need to drive it with earmuffs and so to the front engine pair we'll start in the BMW M2 competition which we've driven a reasonable amount on road and track already in the UK and in fact there are videos we do a big handling test every year and the M2 competition last year was in it there are videos available from that which I would commend to you and also if you do like this sort of thing I mean we really properly do test cars you know we go to great lengths and some expense to do so so I do hope you enjoy it if you like it like it if you subscribe please you'll never miss one and if you turn on notifications we'll even tell you that you may be missing one so I recommend all of those things to you and meantime to the M2 competition so the first thing is to note it has quite an engine oh, it has a really good engine so there was a time I think some point last year when BMW said right we're gonna stop with the current M2 will stick an M3 engine in it, detuned, so it's still a 3 litre 6. And the idea is then BMW's M division doesn't have to get so many different engines through the WLTP emissions regulations. But this is still a real zinger of an engine. Now, I've just got out of the Alpine not very long ago, so you can immediately tell, well, the engine's out the front. This is a heavier, bigger, gloopier car. It's more of a muscle car, more of a hot rod. The M2 kind of has been that way since its launch. The competition, when that came out, reduced some of those tendencies, made it a bit more of a sports car, a bit more engaging. And I've got to say, I have a lot of time for this car because it's got the extra beef, 
and the extra oomph that the Alpine does not. And it's got a limited slip differential and the engine out the front. It's got a much more old school chassis balance to it. You know, you kind of trail the brakes in, set it up, and then as you get on the power, it then drives itself straight, or more than straight if you really want to. But there is poise and agility in a way that when the M2 was launched, although I liked it a lot, there was that, that poise that it didn't have back then and that little bit of extra focus. Steering wheel is a bit too squishy. I wish it was a bit less squishy than this, but the steering weight and the actual sort of road feel are good. Not alive, but good. I think it's important to remember actually that you know, this is a German car. As a result, it will have done a lot of development miles on the Autobahn. And that means it has to be very, very stable at high speeds. And it is. So the fact that the engine is where it is, it's a stable car, it's a bruiser. The fact that it's as agile and fun in corners as it is, is I think a credit to BMW's engineers. It's not a surprise, is it? I mean, they've been doing it for quite a long time. They're quite good at it. They all do cool things. They're not all perfect. They all do cool things in different ways. Let's find out, finally, of the quartet, what the Supra is like, and then we shall attempt some kind of verdict. So here we go, Toyota Supra. Well, there's certainly been a bit of a fanfare around this car. We've been waiting, we've been teased, driven prototypes, but now we've got it to ourselves and we're gonna find out just what it's like. Now there's been a lot of hype around this car, lots of people in our industry particularly, saying what a great reputation it's got to live up to, it's got to be amazing, but actually think back, and the back catalogue of Toyota Supras isn't that great really. The last one, yeah, that, that was pretty cool, but not greatly lauded. The ones before that, well, they were kind of hairy chested medallion man cars, more sort of Pontiac and Corvette rivals than actual genuine sports cars. So actually, anything this car does has got to be an improvement. Now, obviously, we've got to talk about what's underneath. Yes, it's a BMW, but Toyota claim they've, they've been leading development right from the start, particularly the chassis. So you could argue the people that made the GT86 have made a great chassis and it's got the best bits of BMW running gear, straight six with 335 horsepower, 368 pounds foot of torque and it comes in at 1600 RPM and it feels like it, it absolutely rows along the straights from almost any revs, any gear, this thing absolutely goes, sounds a bit synthetic, I've got to be honest, it's a bit computer gamey but it's effective. ZF eight-speed gearbox, car what I wouldn't have to have the Porsche's six-speed manual now. It's fairly quick on upshifts, but the downshifts, particularly in sport mode, they thump home, kind of upsetting the balance of the car. Anyone that's used to a nice smooth heel and toe or a PDK blip will be a little bit surprised by that. But, you know, it's effective enough. And, oh, mellow, yeah, it's quite lively. The rest of the car, well, what you feel is that it's about 10% away from being really good. It's got a lovely supple feel on the road, even in sports setting, and, and that's another thing. There is a gratifying lack of modes here. You have normal, press a button, you have sport. You can configure steering, throttle, gearbox individually, but other than that, it's quite simple. And compared to, say, the BMW, where you've got multiple modes, that's really refreshing. So. Even in sport, the ride is quite supple. There's a fair, fair amount of control there, but you start to really lean on it, and that 1,500 kilograms starts to show, and it can get thrown around quite a bit as the suspension struggles to control the movement. But take it a bit easier, and you can have quite a lot of fun. It feels heavier than it actually is, and looks, it looks quite lithe. I mean, the looks are great, but start to get up into it and it does feel a bit like it's struggling to keep up with everything. 
the Cayman feels much, much lighter on its feet, but there's just something quite nice about an old school, big engined, rear wheel drive sports car. It's not sharp, but then maybe that's what the GRMN's there for. This is the everyday car. The one that will give you a bit of fun when you want, but actually you can live with it. You don't want to punch yourself in the face after every journey because you've been jostled around. And you can quite easily overcome the, the traction. It's, it's fun, it really is. It's good, it's not great, but it's good. And I quite like it. Now we wanted to do lap times, but when we got round to it, the rain started coming down and the conditions would not have been equal for each of the cars. So unfortunately, we were unable to put them against the stopwatch, which trust me, is as frustrating for us as it is for you. Thank you, mate. Pleasure. Stop start. Has stop started. Let's go. Right, do you like this? Do you know what? I think I do. I how, think I do. Go on, how much do you like it? Uh, I like it a lot, mm. but not 100% totally love it. It's a good car, it's not a great car yet. Have, having driven all of these, yep. right, have you decided, because I haven't, <laughs> no. have you decided which one is best? No. Is there a best? No. No, I'm not sure there is either. They're all good. I think we were saying earlier, they've, they've all got flaws. Yeah. And with the other three, particularly in the case of the Porsche's engine, maybe the BMW's ride and compromise nature, uh, that are, are big enough that you just, they grate so much that you think, oh, all the rest of it's brilliant, but could I live with those? Whereas the, this has more flaws. There are more flaws in this, but they're less irritating. You could live with them more, yeah. I think. And I don't know whether that makes it the car that's the best of the bunch. Okay. So you, so all right, you've got a ten-year-old Ford Mondeo wagon. I wish. Uh, yeah. And you're going to take one of these away on a, a you know, monthly contract on a PCP, whatever. You're going to, you're going to all right, that's it. I'm going to buy a sport. That's it, darling. Go go and buy a sports yeah. car, and I'm going to keep it for three years. So we've got the family wagon. Now I'm going to have a sports car on the drive. Yeah. Of the four, which one is it going to be? Cayman. No, no, it's not going to be the Cayman. Now, no, this, not, not this, Mon, this Mondeo yeah. that we've got is, uh, it's is a, that being it's used? It's a serviceable family car that you'd use every day if you want to, or you could jump in the sports car. You know, they're both at your, they are both at your service. I think I'd want to drive my sports car every day as well. Okay. And if that were the case, and it would do everything, it would take me to the shops, uh, it would hack me up, up and down the M1 or the M40, it would drive me into town, but when I wanted to have a bit of fun, I think because this rides so nicely, and I know that sounds like an old man thing to say, it doesn't spoil the dynamics enough. I think I would maybe just choose this, maybe. I think, I, I, you know what, I think I agree. I do think I agree. I think if I had a, an M3 on the drive, yeah. then maybe I'd have a, an Alpine as well, or, yeah. or the Cayman as well. Yeah. Um, but actually, as a, as a usable daily sports coupe, yeah. I think you're right. This is not necessarily the most exciting or the most involving, but it is probably the least irritatingly flawed. Yes. And it's a bit peacocky, but it looks really good as yeah. well, I think. Right, so that is a non-conclusion conclusion. All right. The best car to drive here is... Cayman. An yeah, the Cayman. An element of all of them. It would oh, be, I see. It would be the Cayman with the agility of the, the Alpine and the engine of the M2 and the looks and attitude of this, maybe? Yeah, like and the gearbox of the Cayman. And the gearbox of the Cayman. But uh, look, there's a mixed match. The short of it is, buy the one you want. That's the short of it. Yeah. But five years ago, if somebody said, you're going to do a mega test of sports coupes and the Porsche Cayman is not going to obviously win, I would not have believed somebody when they said that. But no. now that is the case. There are at least four cars which you could have quite happily over a Cayman. So that is the non-verdict verdict. verdict. Um, and if you like more of non-verdict verdicts, we usually come to a better conclusion than this. We also do drag races, news, reviews, merch shows, yada, yada, yada. So if you like it, give us an up thumb, subscribe, turn on notifications. You'll never miss one. We will be back to make fewer decisions next time.